In August of this year, the Church of England was rocked by its most serious sex scandal in living memory. Chris Brain, the Anglican priest, was accused of running a cult within the established church and of sexually abusing more than 20 women in his congregation. The Church of England was accused of neglecting its duty to care for its parishioners. The nine o'clock service, one of the Church of England's most successful experiments, was, it seems, about to be destroyed by its own priest. Now, Chris Brain and some of the women he is accused of abusing talk in public for the first time. For a priest in a church setting, I'd have to say I was involved in improper sexual conduct with a number of women. The story begins 16 years ago in 1979 when Chris Brain, a Christian rock musician, arrived in Sheffield with his wife Winnie and several members of their band. They were looking for a house in which to live and a church in which to explore a new vision of faith and to create a new version of worship. They were directed to St. Thomas's, an Anglican church with an evangelical tradition. We were very caught up with the whole, certainly in the late 70s, it was the whole movement of radical discipleship. And um, if you're going to have a faith, then it's not going to be something nominal and part-time. It's got to be something that engages the whole of your life. This was political. This was simple lifestyle, real, real community, real financial, um, living in one purse. Uh, none of this talking about it, academic stuff, we were doing it, um, and we were sticking two fingers up to, to normal, um, to middle-class church um, ways of behaviour. The senior vicar at St Thomas's was Robert Warren. Sympathetic to charismatic evangelism, he saw the rebellious young Christians as a link to a whole new generation of potential churchgoers. They'd had a, a love-hate relationship with the church. They, they were committed to its message, to its gospel, but didn't like the way that that was expressed, the, the, the cultural baggage that went with it. We became like a subgroup within the church um, that was dressed differently, acted differently, were very... would either sit right at the front aggressively or right at the back, um, ignoring it all. And what we do is we pray and, and the heavens open up and God comes down and swallows you. In 1985, American evangelist John Wimber came to Sheffield. Robert Warren invited him to come to St. Thomas's and persuaded Chris Brain and his friends to attend the service. Now, Lord, I ask for the power to come. Power to heal the sick. Power to cause the blind to see. Power to raise the dead power to cast out demons. Let the power go through their whole body, Lord. In the name of Jesus. There was a remarkable sense of the presence of God, and a good number of them were, were in tears, uh, uh, weeping and speaking prophetically uh, and uh, interceding, praying for the young people of the city. Many people went through what you may, may have seen if you've ever been to a, a Pentecostal church, so, uh, like um, we called it being zapped by the Spirit at the time. Some people in tents, I don't know how many people were sort of putting it on, how many people were having genuine ecstatic experiences, but um, something incredibly powerful happened, mystically powerful happened that night. Now the Spirit of God comes in waves and he just hits several of you. Now come Holy Spirit. In an evening full of signs and wonders, Robert Warren discerned a very specific message. Thank you, Lord. It was actually during that event that I had a, a sense in the midst of all the upheaval and mayhem that was going on that God was wanting to add to the church two or three hundred young people like that in a fairly short space of time, which I understood to be a matter of months rather than days or, or years. The idea came up uh, that uh, we should be allowed to start our own service. And uh, the only time in, on Sunday to do that was uh, after the, 
after the 6.30 service, because there was a number of services during the day at St Thomas's. It was either the afternoon or the evening. And because the evening was when we usually do, did things and went to clubs and so on, um, we set it going at 9 o'clock, and that's why it became the 9 o'clock service. When we actually started the 9 o'clock service, there was, there was nothing to, to debate or discuss about who should lead it. Uh, if you'd asked anybody else, they would have all said, no, Chris is, is the, the person with the, the gifts, the originality, and he's the person who's leading it. We want him to lead us. Everyone was now looking to Chris Brain as the right man at the right time and in the right place. What we've got here is a combination of three things, all of which in themselves might have looked quite innocent, but together created problems. The first one is this corporate sense of empowerment that now we have been visited by God in a very special sense for his purposes. This involves everybody. This is corporate, this is quite egalitarian, everybody's involved. But then secondly, some people are more specially endowed than others. Chris Brain, who's already seen very much as a leader, now becomes a supernatural leader endowed by God to lead people on into this new awareness of what's going on in, in God's kingdom and to help the whole world. It's a big vision thing now, and this is the leader who will carry this vision through. But then add the third thing, absolutely essential thing. This gets legitimated by the official church for the best of motives and the most pragmatic of reasons. It's a success. Chris Brain and the fledgling nine o'clock service were inspired by the chance to design a club culture style of worship. St. Thomas's Parish Council were persuaded by Robert Warren to give the young Christians the go-ahead to run the experiment. The nine o'clock service wanted to reject all the 18th and 19th century rituals of the conventional church and to seek inspiration from more ancient Christian traditions. At the same time, they wanted to bring into the church the kind of contemporary art and music that they were working with outside. They were fired by the vision that they were creating an Anglican church for their generation and possibly for generations to come. We started with about 50 people, I think, and over a number of weeks it grew very quickly to about two or 300. Um, some people were visited were absolutely couldn't believe it. They, you know, they thought, what on earth is going on here? It wasn't going to church on Sunday. Do you know what I mean? It was something that took up all your energy, your time, your money, your emotional commitments, everything. I gave quite a lot of my income, um, whether um, that would be money or, you know, sharing my possessions and things, um, but a lot of my time. But it was because I passionately believed in in what we were doing, working together as a, as a community, as a body, furthering the kingdom of God. It would be very dark and there would be um, images projected onto the walls and there would also be sometimes film loop images projected onto screens or on the walls and there would be a music, an ambient music beat going on and everybody was talking and some people were dancing and some people were just chatting to each other and there was a real buzz whenever you walked in and then the service would start and it was, it was exciting and it was fun. And we felt as if God was there. The teaching we used to get was absolutely, I mean, it was so powerful. Some of the sermons and things that people did about things like simple lifestyle and and when we started to do some of the environmental stuff, you really felt like you'd been kicked in the guts. It was incredible. You could really sense God around. OK, shall we stand up? So we would get busloads of people, youth groups from all over the country, turning up to see a multimedia worship set up. So we would get busloads of people, youth groups from all over the country, turning up to see a multimedia worship set up. Because obviously the church was not, hasn't got many young people in it, etc., etc. Those young people in it don't relate to the worship, therefore the nine o'clock service is doing something that, that looks absolutely brilliant if you are 
um, in the world view that you need to do something extra for young people to attract them or even to hold them. I celebrated the, the fact that young people who were so evidently not the sort of people you would find queuing up to get into church, which is what they were doing, um, uh, coming uh, to church and participating, obviously, in a very real, meaningful way in, in worship. So it was a celebration of, of that which, essentially, we felt God was doing amongst us. As things progressed, it got better and better. I mean, some of the times in worship were absolutely fantastic, the sense of love and fun and enjoyment and to just go somewhere with your favourite music and to sing your heart out and to dance and be with your best friends. It was fantastic. Well, we absolutely implicitly believed that what we were doing was the most significant thing that was going to happen to the church and maybe beyond. This was going to change the church. It was going to change the country. Um, and surely everybody wanted that, didn't they? All the effort and commitment was paying off. Word spread beyond Sheffield of a powerful experiment in youth worship which was attracting congregations of up to 600. The Church of England liked what they saw in the 9 o'clock service and its leader, Chris Brain. I was very impressed by him. I was impressed by, it sounds curious to say this, by what I felt was his integrity and the way that, coming in from the outside to the Christian faith, he was able to relate his own personal spirituality to the traditional spirituality of the church and become a sort of vehicle in which it could be conveyed to others. It was completely new. It was gripping the idealism of so many young people. It was right on the frontier of evangelism. It was breaking new ground. It was interfacing with a whole youth culture in Britain that the church, by and large, was not even getting within 100 miles of. In November 1990, Chris Brain and Robert Warren went to see the Archbishop of Canterbury-elect, the Right Reverend George Carey. He actually said to me, I'd be happy, very happy, to see a 9 o'clock service in every town and city of the United Kingdom. The Archbishop of Canterbury later invited Chris Brain to contribute to his book on evangelism in the 90s, Treasure in the Field. But the most visible example of the affirmation that the nine o'clock service was enjoying came when the Bishop of Sheffield conducted one of the largest confirmation services in the history of the diocese. There were a hundred people, hundred young people, people that you wouldn't normally see in a church, being confirmed into the Church of England. And it was a great occasion, and the bishop was there on his throne, and um, Chris Brain was sitting next to me. Myself and a couple of others were doing the service leading, and we were dressed up in cassocks, and it was all very pompous and ceremonial. But at this moment of greatest triumph, those at the centre of the nine o'clock service already knew there were problems. I remember sitting there, and Chris Brain, every time, about 30 seconds before I went up, to say something, said, what have you got on underneath your cassock? And I was like, shut up, and go up and say a prayer or something about how, you know, great it is that men and women are treated justly and equally. Sit back down again, then it's my turn to go up again in a bit, 30 seconds before, he's whispering again at me, what you got on underneath your cassock? What, what you'd like to do underneath my cassock? It was a great laugh. And <laughs> I remember getting up from a chair and standing up there and thinking, and there was the bishop sitting there, and everybody's thinking, oh, this is bloody marvellous, all these people joining the church. I'm thinking, I'm trapped. I'm absolutely trapped here. I think we have to understand that the people who made up the 9 o'clock service were good Christians. They loved God, they wanted to do the best for God. They saw church as a sanctuary. They saw it as a place of safety. And in the situation when suddenly something unexpected happens, something harmful happens, 
something out of the ordinary happens, you feel trapped, you feel as if something has gone desperately wrong. How do you react when you are wanting to serve God? Well, one of the ways you react is that you feel you shouldn't dishonor God's work. That's the phrase that is often used. You mustn't dishonor God's work. Perhaps there's something wrong with you. Perhaps it's just a, a minor aberration. Overall, things are really good. And you get caught in a kind of a no-man's land. And you can get trapped in a no-man's land for a very long time. Whatever doubts there might have been, the authorities and the congregation were carried along by their enthusiasm for the success of the nine o'clock service. This didn't just happen recently. This is a progressive thing over years. Of, of believing that he was the voice of God. I mean, the charismatic movement empowered Chris Brain beyond measure, absolutely beyond measure, sent him ballistic um, because of the, the power of you know, prophecy and insight and, and all this sort of thing. Uh, he was sanctioned by, by people that I respected and, and looked up to and, and was in awe of. Robert Warren was happy to see huge congregations of young people regularly attending his church, and he saw nothing to be concerned about. As I look back to, to what I was involved in, I was involved in a creative, original uh, experiment, and I, I don't see uh, anything that w was uh, that I could recognize as, as seeds of something um, unhealthy that needed more action than than I took but what seemed to be happening was that under the very noses of the Church of England clerics who had pastoral responsibility for him Chris Brain was becoming something of a cult leader I, I was encouraged to cut away my old life um, that was an old life that was a sinful life my past had to be forgotten and uh, in fact, it was, uh, it was seen as a uh, potential drag back into the, the ways of darkness. And um, so I, I really, sh I mean, I burnt all my old photographs. I cleared out all sorts of things, you know, as, a, as like a statement to, of, um, of getting rid of that past. I, I dropped all my friends. Um, and I, all the things that I'd been taught and learned were now suspect. Right? Um, and all that I was getting taught from Chris was truth. It almost became a sort of a nos culture, the style of dress that people had, the kind of music that people would listen to, the way that they would decorate their homes. Um, we all, in some ways, started to do things very similarly because we were led from the front, because that was the way that Chris did things. Chris said, you know, I needed to change the way I dressed in order to become part of the culture that we were supposedly communicating in and with. So he changed my dress. Well, he and, he and his wife, between them, you know, got me into clothes that were more suitable. So from the very beginning, I threw off my own choice about what I wore. If I was pleasing Chris and I was pleasing God, it got to that point. Um, because anything I did that was, you know, wrong to, towards Chris or slightly not not his liking you know was was I was made to think it was absolutely abusive and to God and opposing God basically I remember talking to one woman who had completely given her commitment to the vision to the nine o'clock service to the leadership and she told me in in utter confidence that she had she could possibly be dead within 24 hours or one of her children could possibly die. I mean, that's an incredible thing to put over anybody. It's really hard to know what people could see when they came in, um, because obviously, in retrospect, it seemed bleeding obvious that people were afraid and strange things were going on. Um, I don't know whether they just were blind to it themselves and couldn't see it, or whether they chose to shut their eyes to it. Around this time, the church selected Chris Brain for ordination as an Anglican priest. The priest-in-waiting was convinced that he and his young family needed extra help from members of the congregation. The simple life espoused by the nine o'clock service seemed, for the Brain family at least, to be taking a rather luxurious turn. But it was claimed there was a religious precedent for what became known as the home-based team. 
in the old days, apparently, what, one, of the, one of the things around monasteries and convents was that, um, oh, it was in one particular order, where the monks went out on mission and the nuns cared for them back home and looked after them, met their needs, and, you know, made the food and all that sort of thing and cared for them when they came back. We're a base for them, or provided for them, obviously in a separate place, but, you know, cared for them, provided for them. And that was the kind of, that was, that was one of the um, kind of images that was kind of given us for the home base team. The home base team was very simply a way when Winnie and I were both working um, for the service, it involved such long hours that at first people volunteered to help out in the house uh, and then it turned into they decided, I can't remember who decided, one of them decided to organise it properly so that um, it was more efficient and rather than have one or two people doing it, it was three or four. It was very secret for certainly a, a year or so and gradually, um, you know, the word got around that Chris had these uh, well, we used to call them uh, the Lycra Lovelies or Charlie's Angels or whatever. And they were all these incredibly thin, anorexic-looking, uh, attractive women, all with very similar hairstyles. And it was very odd that they were all women. And they cooked and they cleaned and they looked after Winnie and Ruth and Chris. That just seemed to me to be incredibly strange. It's like everyone was making out that Chris was really stressed out and he'd got all these important things to do and he needed all these people to help. And it's like, hang on a minute, I'm married to a medic, I've got a small child, we, you know, we've, I hardly ever see him, we, you know, we're always under stress. Where's my flaming home base team? In the evenings at the Brain household, the duties of the home base team, which eventually included seven women, became fairly comprehensive. If you were the person who was in the house at that time, he might or he might not ask you to put him to bed, depending on what he felt like, depending whether he had another woman with him who was putting him to bed or was spending time with him. Some people, if they were there late at night babysitting, maybe there when I was at home, and if it was somebody involved uh, um, as friends with me, that would happen. And, you know, if it was somebody quite often... Um, I think it was two or three people that were prepared to sometimes massage me before I went to bed to relax me and so on if I came in very late at night or something like that. I don't know what that says to me. I like that way mm. under the back. Just... Meanwhile, the church yeah. had no doubts about Chris Brain's suitability for ordination. It doesn't matter about getting your feet in, does it? Indeed, the authorities were taking steps to ensure that he was ordained sooner rather than later. Normally it takes four years, but Chris Brain was made a priest after only two and a half. At, at, the, at the end, there was a speeding up uh, of the process, and it, it did seem to be appropriate because of this strange situation. Here was somebody training to, uh, to be a priest who was leading... Um, arguably one of the largest churches in the, in the diocese. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant Christopher. Everyone apparently shared in the enthusiasm for Chris Brain's ordination. Although he claims that he was never happy with the traditional role of priest. Upon your servant George. The thought of a single male charismatic a person leading a group of people um, had all the implications of, you know, um, a very patriarchal male churches, you know, where you've got a male leader at the front um, giving the, the uh, uh, giving the spiel every week and the church built around a particular personality. Um, and therefore I hated the thought of it. Well, it certainly wasn't my experience of somebody around Chris at the time that he was uh, shy about being ordained. I mean, a, hu a huge fuss was made about the ordination service itself, if that, 
in itself is any evidence. One of the things was that uh, to find the right cassock for Chris. And the country was searched high and low to find the sort of cassock that Robert De Niro wore in the mission, because that really suited how Chris looked. And eventually, successfully ended up with the cassock that was worn in the mission. I think we got it from Paramount Studios, and it cost an arm and a leg. Yeah, that's Oh, did I do the right things? Did I say the right things? And did I look like a Nancy boy? <laughs> you didn't look like a Nancy boy. <laughs> you didn't. You looked brilliant. Did I look like the mission, or did I look like something out of a British home store <laughs> catalogue lingerie <laughs> section? Oh, that's what it was. This is the first time that Chris is presiding at communion since his ordination last month. Upon his return to the congregation, affirmed as a newly ordained Anglican priest, Chris Brain continued to explore increasingly intimate relationships with female members of his congregation on a variety of different pretexts. Sexual healing or experiments in sexual ethics or explorations of intimacy. There was an exploration of how um, we could be intimate and physically and erotically intimate with each other without um, being lustful, without being genital, without being um, unfaithful to our partners, particularly marriage partners, without breaking covenants with them. Um, there was a group, a fluctuating group of women and some men as well, who were working on this um, with Chris. He never mentioned to me that the context of all this was um, to do with experimentation, sexual experimentation. Absolutely not. And um, I saw it as, at first he was just being friendly, um, you know, showing me love as a friend. Um, and then as well it became, you know, a healing thing for me because I was so underconfident in my sexuality and, and being a woman. Through him, he would teach me to discover my potential as a woman. I would, I would come into sexual wholeness through, through allowing him to help me into it. And I trusted him on that score, I think, because, uh, largely because he was married. To say that the sexual activity that took place in the 9 o'clock service was ex uh, experimenting about sexuality or, uh, or even uh, sexuality and spirituality is a ruse. For me, I think what was happening was that um, Chris Brain was, he was grooming the women. He was trying to say, this is consensual, this is, we're all in this together. And that, what he was trying to say was, if I get you to consent, then you will not see it as abuse. So it was a very subliminal message. What he was trying to, it's manipulation of the highest order. And he probably even believes it himself. Most of the time, uh, uh, if I was involved sexually, it was normally after a period of a long, a long period of developing a close relationship with that person, where the boundaries of cuddling or um, spending time together or whatever, usually nearly always on a one-to-one, -one, led to increasing sexual activity. That was one of my major boundaries, that um, being orgasmic was something that I saved for my relationship with my husband and that it wasn't appropriate and I put a big full stop before it got to that point. Um, and Chris respected that. I can say that it escalated um, from something that I found acceptable from my background in the first place to something by the end that I find unbelievable now <laughs> that I was doing, that he was doing. Um, it has cost me dearly, very dearly. I, I know that that's going to stay with me um, whether 
I do or I don't form a relationship with another man in the future. And I also feel like in some way he he owned my body. He, he I was his to do what he wanted with. And uh, that disgusts me, actually. He was the first, the very first person I'd ever been sexual with. And, um, I mean, I feel like now that... Uh, and because that was abusive, <laughs> I can see now that, that how abusive that was. Um, I feel, you know, I, I find it very hard to trust any man, actually. Um, I think it'll take me a long time before I can actually believe that someone isn't just after sex and my body, that they're actually just valuing me as a, a whole person. I did get gratification. The gratification I was after actually was not sexual. It was, although there was sexual gratification, um, if I was any agenda for myself in there, and again, I state that I would never use anybody to do that. I would not use somebody. Um, it was in the area of just closeness and affection and friendship. He regularly would talk about how we were discovering a postmodern definition of sexuality in the church. Again, it's language, language covering up the fact of what was going, really going on. One bloke getting his rocks off with about 40 women. Many people will be saying that shouldn't they have said no? Shouldn't they have gone to somebody very quickly? I, I would say that it's, it's almost impossible to report a minister who's molesting you. So, and it's not their fault. The guy who has the responsibility and most power is the minister. He should not do this. It is entirely his responsibility to keep the boundaries. Some members of the service did begin to have doubts, not just about the intimacies behind closed doors, but also about how far Chris Brain had steered the whole nine o'clock service away from its founding principles. But his growing reputation made it hard to complain. People would come and visit major, I can't remember the names, but senior church people and say, after they'd spoken to Chris Brain, they'd say, I think I'm in the presence of a prophet. There were many, many examples of this, repeatedly, over and over and over again. Now, all the time, what Chris would do is then it used that to show how irresponsible, how lethal it would be if someone like myself turned against Chris Brain. Look what I would be bringing down. I would be bringing, to, bringing down an entire movement that was for the benefit of thousands and thousands of people. In 1992, one member of the congregation did speak out against Chris Brain and the leadership team. She went directly to the Bishop of Sheffield. The concerns I had were around um, leadership and secrecy and the vision and um, theology, um, communication, prophecy, social action, um, the accounts never being uh, communication, you know, why weren't the accounts presented to the body, all this kind of stuff. And his reaction was fairly... He was fairly dismissive of me. He ob obviously thought I was a troublemaker. In any institution, there are people who disagree. She disagreed with what they were doing. She was entitled to her views. But they weren't expressed in a way that called, in my mind, in question the whole enterprise. These allegations might have I don't think public. you. I, I don't think you remotely realise the number of these letters of complaint about congregations that bishops get. You take them up, you follow them up, and I... I don't quite know what one could have, you know, one hasn't got a reason for assuming that everything that everybody says has to lead to instant action. Perhaps one should have done, but again, I don't know at that stage how one would have changed the situation. Obviously, once I decided to write this paper and, and make a, a stand against what I saw the injustices within NOS going on, and... Um, I just, I had no alternative really but to leave because I was being ostracised, I was being pushed out um, and it was really quite agonising for me and I left to continue working with the homeless in London which was um, something I was passionate about. In fact, the nine o'clock leadership had heard of Mel's complaints and had taken swift action to undermine her. Mel. Um, was then rubbished very effectively by the nine o'clock service staff and 
um, particularly by Chris and the, the person who was actually his closest leader at that time, they suggested that she was um, suffering from an illness uh, and uh, that uh, she shouldn't be listened to because of this serious illness. When people left the church, often because they were unhappy or very critical of what had been going on, the message that was spread throughout the church was these people have got their own issues to deal with. There are reasons why they were jealous or they wanted to get their own power base. And so anybody who was critical was deeply criticised themselves. Nothing, it seems, was allowed to get in the way of the irresistible rise of the nine o'clock service. The Bishop of Sheffield wanted them to have their own church and helped them to move to a brand new place of worship. Hello again. Our next service won't be here. It'll be in Ponds Forge International Complex in town on March the 7th. So that's about five weeks from now. The place that we've got, which is the rotunda in uh, Ponds Forge, underneath a big swimming pool there, it's just brilliant. I, mean, I can see everybody packed like sardines now. But there, there is loads and loads of room. I can't remember how much bigger than this place it is, but um, it's going to feel empty for a while. This geographical shift to the centre of Sheffield was matched by a theological shift to the boundaries of new Christian theology. We move again from a very fundamentalist reading of scripture to um, certainly a much more environmental, uh, ecological um, theology. Um, it means you can see and recognise Christ in the beauty of any living thing. And it also means that you can recognise what Christians understand as Christ in other faiths, which for us is a massive agenda to be able to have Buddhists coming in, into the service and be able to worship the God and have some kind of connection with them um, uh, and feel as though we're about, about the same thing. The Archdeacon of Sheffield was an enthusiastic supporter of these theological developments and even contributed financially to the nine o'clock service. I started going really to see what was going on and really as an extension of the bishop's authority within the diocese and to try and see and monitor what was happening. It became something which I was excited by, found it one of the most creative things that I'd been involved in with the Church of England. It stood for something dynamic liturgically. It stood for something vital spiritually. It actually provided me, in the end, I think a very real new spiritual life and encouragement. And I was very attracted by what it stood for in terms of the understanding of the planet, of the future of environment, and the relevance of the Christian faith to those vital issues. The Planetary Mass turned out to be exactly the kind of liturgical revolution that the prominent American theologian Matthew Fox had been looking for for years. He flew to Sheffield to meet Chris. Issues. The Planetary Mass turned out to be exactly the kind of liturgical revolution that the prominent American theologian Matthew Fox had been looking for for years. He flew to Sheffield to meet Chris Brain and to attend the nine o'clock service in November of 1993. Yesterday, when I came here for the first time, came 10,000 miles to be here, and I walked in this door, and I was not disappointed. It was mystery. It was enticement behind the door. For months, I've been asking what's behind the door at Sheffield, at the Planetary Mass at Sheffield. Chris Brain's biggest public risk to date was paying off. He had created a church and a style of worship for the new millennium. He had achieved national and international approval from the Anglican community. But his private risk-taking continued, and the people involved were becoming more and more fragile. Through the whole spectrum of abuse, um, I got more, I got depressed and um, 
you know, I started not sleeping well and uh, losing my appetite for weeks on end sometimes, um, getting suicidal. Um, I mean, by the end of it, I'd totally lost a sense of who I was. I was living in, you know, in some void <laughs> away from the real me. And, uh, and I certainly didn't know who God was anymore. I'd lost that. I am most angry about what he's done to me. <laughs> very angry indeed. I'm very angry about what he's done to all my friends. It is abominable. It's unspeakable. The pain that people is, are experiencing is unspeakable. It won't ever be able to be spoken. The depth of it. Never. In this increasingly volatile situation, Chris Brain and a small team were spending more and more of their time preparing to go to America to work with Matthew Fox. Indeed, Chris Brain resigned from the day-to-day -day running of the 9 o'clock service. In his absence, those who knew most started to talk to one another. They came to conclusions which they brought to the church authorities. What we were saying was that abuse, religious, sexual, psychological abuse, had gone on in the nine o'clock service for years, from the beginning right through to the end in various forms, in various ways to different people, but that fundamentally the nine o'clock service was abusive, that we were willing to testify to that to our, ourselves, our own experience of that, and see what happened. Physically exploited by a vicar in Sheffield. How many women are involved is unclear. One report puts the figure at 20. The clock service in Sheffield. Its leader, Chris Brain, is said by the church. Charismatic personality. Hundreds would attend, and it became famous well beyond. It appeared to many people to be a kind of cult under the influence of the Reverend Chris Brain. Of improper sexual contact. The centre of with allegations number. that he engaged in improper sexual conduct with members of his congregation. This is not a sex scandal. This is not a sex scandal. It is a scandal within w of which sex is a part. This is a scandal about religious, the abuse of religious power. When all the stuff came out in the news, they wheeled on George Carey to say, um, you know, how do you feel about this nine o'clock service thing? And uh, he said, I feel really let down. <laughs> I, I don't know how we didn't break the television screen in the house that we were in at that time. He felt let down. It's his job to make sure, and he's crowing his jobs to make sure that people like Chris Brain don't get through, don't get allowed to continue. Where were the checks and balances? Obviously, and the Archbishop said this as soon as he heard uh, the news, he was deeply saddened by what had happened, saddened uh, for the people themselves who have been very much in his prayers, uh, saddened that anyone could misuse their authority and damage people so much. He said it on a number of occasions. If any one clergyman uh, steps out of line in this way, then that damages all the 10,000 and more parish clergy working in the Church of England. I feel incredibly let down by that. I mean, in the I do not expect anybody to take responsibility for my life. That's m I have to do that. But at least come and stand with us. At least come and say, yes, this happened in the church. Yes, it's possible for this to happen. Yes, people come to church to trust, and you came to, into church to trust, and this has happened to you because you trusted and because you wanted God and you wanted something good. And this is what's happened. And, and we are deeply sorry for what has happened. And we are deeply, we as the church, as the hierarchy, feel betrayed by this man and what he has done in betraying faith in God. They're not saying it. Two nights ago, I sat up and I screamed, why didn't you save us, bastards? And I was thinking about those who had pastoral responsibility over Chris. If the bishop was responsible for every sermon preached, every service taken, every action of every clergyman and lay leader in the diocese, well, it, 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 it wouldn't work. So I, I, I'm quite honestly puzzled, really, as to what sort of accountability that people are seeking for. I always have it in mind that, in an extreme sense, actually, the nine o'clock service was a, was a congregation of volunteers. Everybody from the Archbishop of Canterbury to 
Stephen Lowe to bishops, theological college principals, industrialists, thinkers, trust uh, organizers, because there's a very big trust given money to NOS. Every single one actually was hoodwinked by this guy. And to that extent, we've all been part of the process which has created this damage. There's a corporate responsibility and a corporate failure, and all the more reason why the corporate body of the church has to own what was happening, not just in the good days, but in the bad days, and own up to it, say sorry, apologize, and do its utmost to be involved in a, a suitable and proper inquiry into all the events that led up to this tragedy and also in trying to put in place through proper recommendations to try and guarantee this does not happen again because the, the very credibility of the Christian gospel is at stake here. I mean, I've, I've, I mean if, people want to, if people want to set up an investigation, good luck to them. I don't myself believe it would serve any useful purpose. I think we know what happened. I don't think it is likely to happen again in the, in the sense of the structures of the congregation it would be a fool who said that we couldn't have another crisp brain. I mean, sin is with us always. And we live in an age of extraordinarily loose um, sexual morals. What happened there is something that in certain walks of life happens frequently, lamentable though it may be. It would be appalling if something like that happened again, but it would be a foolish person, I think, who said in the long history of the church that it never could. I want him brought down, I want him stopped, I want him defrocked, I want him removed from any power situation or the hope of regaining any, any of this kind of power because I have lived in and seen the level of destruction it causes. I think it's a bit sad that they would see that something like a punishment or something like that or would address something. I would have thought the thing that they would, I hope, would want to see or what I would want to see, a Christian community would want to see is somebody who is repentant and who, somebody who is one, willing to change and put things straight put things right, which I am willing to do. Um, if they feel as though my resignation um, would be some symbol of that, um, yeah, I think I'm prepared to resign, yeah. And that, only hours before this programme went out, is what Chris Brain did. He is no longer a priest, but many of the hundreds of young Christians who made up the nine o'clock service have left the church disillusioned. The rest are without their place of worship. I do think the Church of England has distanced itself and would probably like to from the scandal of the nine o'clock service. Uh, life goes on, time passes, we keep thinking, oh, well, given enough time, we've put enough space between the events that have come to light, uh, you know, we'll get rid of this, it will not be the embarrassment it is. But in fact, the great danger is, unless it's properly investigated, unless we can learn lessons from it, there is no guarantee it couldn't happen again.